Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, before I start, uh, let me just quickly highlight that your strategic engages in business in, uh, in Myanmar. Uh, so before I start, I want to check whether any of you have been to Myanmar. Can you raise your hands? Yeah. This makes it very easy for me because I can say whatever I want and uh, you won't contradict me. Okay. So Yoma, um, we're a business conglomerate uh, engaging in a number of uh, businesses in Myanmar. Uh, this is actually, uh, we just finished our 10th year of being listed, so this is quite a uh, big moment for us. When we got listed more than 10 years ago, Myanmar was in a very different place. Uh, very few people really knew much about the country. All people talked about was the military rule a country that used to be extremely rich. Uh, in the 50s, it was one of the wealthiest countries in Southeast Asia. In fact, it, from a, a perspective of kind of administrative uh, structure, uh, law and order, it was probably the most advanced in, in Asia. Unfortunately, after 50 years of military rule and uh, a lot of mishaps, uh, we became the poorest uh, of all. And in fact, we were ranked the third poorest country in the world. Very fortunately, six years ago, we had a um, political transition that was peaceful. Uh, it's one of the few situations where we went from a, effectively a military dictatorship into a um, uh, democracy. And since then, we've enjoyed a very healthy uh, development. So this is really a story about Myanmar, the country, the opportunities there. Uh, why you should be interested, and maybe uh, I'll try to make it simple for you in terms of understanding the crux of why this country, to me, is very exciting. I'll also talk a little bit about the country, uh, the, the company, in terms of what we do. A little bit of background about myself. I spent uh, 12 years uh, at Goldman Sachs in investment banking, um, an outfit that actually provided me an opportunity to talk to many, many companies in many countries. And five years ago, I left that role, uh, which was running a business that oversees the whole Asia's corporate uh, coverage. And I decided to go to Myanmar really because it, I've never seen a country in a time that is so exciting. Uh, it truly was uh, really quite moving for me. Of course, my father was born and raised in Myanmar, so I've always con been connected to the country. But Myanmar from extremely advanced country to extremely poor, five years ago I saw that we're at, at the infection point of becoming extremely prominent again. And I'm glad to say that last five years some of that has uh, worn out uh, and I think that we're really talking about a multi-decade uh, recovery story here. Yeah. In a very short run, uh, let me just say that there has been a lot of press about Myanmar's economic development, maybe slowing down, maybe stalling. Maybe the new government that has been in office for the last year or so has not really gotten the act together. Or maybe they don't really focus on the economy. Let me say very clearly that that is not true. In fact, on the ground, from my perspective, we are heading towards a very, very positive path. And I think you will see the next couple of years has been quite crucial to Myanmar's economic development. We had a transition from effectively the uh, previous military-led um, party to Aung San Suu Kyi's opposition party. Uh, the National League of Democracy took office in April of 2016. And since then, over the last year and a half or so, we've seen actually a very positive relationship development between the military and the current government. To me, that is the most important thing, because as businessmen, what we want is stability. Of course I want democracy, but what I want is a, a pro gradual progression in a way that does not uh, have a risk of backsliding or the development coming back. And I'm very pleased to see that the current government, even though it has been extremely pro-democracy pro and frankly in the past very much against the military. Uh, they've now been able to work very well together. I think that gives us a great platform now uh, to really move forward and accelerate that growth. So political and economic reform process continues. A lot of things you can't see 
which is below the surface, uh, but I am extremely um, kind of uh, positive on the development. Since the beginning of this year, I would say the last six months, uh, in uh, 2017, we've also seen a lot of laws being passed. We have uh, a change of the foreign investment law, uh, clarifying certain things, and kind of simplifying certain bureaucracy. We've also seen uh, changes in foreign financial institution law that allows banks to uh, do a lot more. That continues, and I think that's, that, that progress is also very important. So lots of market opportunities, and the real estate market that has been a bit depressed is now showing signs of recovery. So in the short run, I think uh, we're now seeing uh, green shoots of uh, positive uh, development in the economy. But to look at Myanmar in a very short term, thinking about or guessing what would happen in the next six months is not really the right approach. I think the, the key thing to recognize is that uh, Myanmar has been a very depressed from a development perspective. Everything from infrastructure to education uh, has been behind. And I think we're looking at a couple of decades of recovery. You can see some of those numbers that have come out in the last few years showing very high level of growth. Uh, you know, not, there are not many countries where you see 7.7% GDP growth, and yet people on the ground and actually people internationally are saying that Myanmar is slowing down. Uh, to me, I don't really care whether it's 6.5% or 7.5%, but this level of growth is very uh, positive for the development. And I expect that to continue. The other thing is FDI, foreign direct investment, continues to be coming in. If you see a graph, you may feel that, oh, uh, FDI is slowing down. I can only say that you know, maybe that's what the numbers show for a short while. But in terms of my direct dialogues, I, we're seeing very large mega projects, you know, billions of dollars, but that is on the sideline waiting to come in. In fact, Myanmar has a very strange situation where there's a lot more money looking to be spent in Myanmar or to be invested in Myanmar than what the country has been willing to accept. And I think the government has uh, worked very hard to try to unlock that. If you look at the way foreign investment are approved really is become, it has become a bit of a gatekeeper, making sure that investors are very careful in environmental uh, issues, very careful in labor issues, don't uh, discriminate against local workers, make sure there's a level playing field for uh, the overall economy and for local businesses. Uh, I think that has put a shackle on, on the economic development and that is now coming off. So again, uh, it's, some of these numbers I think we will see uh, improving. Um, you don't have to take my word for it, but I think in the next uh, remaining of this year, uh, we expect to see significant amount of FDI coming in. Singapore, as it happens, is also the second largest investor into Myanmar. This demonstrates a very close relationship within ASEAN, but you know, from a perspective of uh, a Singapore investor, you should also feel comfortable that many of the largest Singapore companies are already operating in Myanmar. There, of course, has been talks about how difficult it is to do business, but the fact is these blue-chip companies are all actually doing quite well, and we continue to see them expanding in the country. The biggest thing to watch out for in Myanmar as a catalyst is probably around infrastructure growth. When I say infrastructure growth, we saw uh, the first wave, which came from telecom-related uh, infrastructure. Uh, in, in our country, we used to have 1% mobile penetration. So out of our 55 million population, only half a million people had mobile phones. Today, that number is closer to 90%. And of that 90% of the population who have phones, most of them are using smartphones. If you think about a country where for many years you had no news, you only had state-sponsored uh, TVs, you had very difficult ways to communicate, and very difficult ways to even wire money from A to B or collect, um, collect goods. Suddenly you have this little device in your hand, which you know, maybe you may think is expensive, but actually Chinese-made smartphones are only $30 US. They would much prefer to eat a few less meals to pay for this. And as a result, they're getting a lot of information. I can tell you, the last two years, the, that growth in information sharing has prompted a number of significant developments. Not least of all, uh, better transparency in the government and less corruption. 
Nowadays, when the president, when the state councilor, when the chief ministers of the key regions meet business people, within 24 hours, you will see that information, that picture on Facebook. Facebook has become actually the primary source of information, and these are not fake news. These are government-sponsored approach to improve transparency. Nowadays, ministers are extremely careful about anything they do because they know that if they do anything wrong, very quickly it spirals out of control on Facebook. So I think that's the first step to stamping out corruption. I cannot say that there's no corruption in the country, but really from the high level down, we've seen a drastic uh, improvement in terms of the transparency and the, and the um, approach that they take to ensure that there's, no, there's less and less corruption in the country. So, Telecom infrastructure has been a big growth driver, and in the next few years, you will see, I think, more and more hard infrastructure. Power, roads, railways, these are very crucial to unlock the logistical uh, barriers. And I think from there, you will see a lot more manufacturing being done. You know, before, uh, before the sanctions were imposed in the 90s, we actually had Myanmar as one of the largest manufacturing hubs. Uh, in, in the world, actually. A lot of those went to Bangladesh, but a lot of the garment factories used to be in Myanmar. Because Myanmar had very good workers, cheap labor, and also geographically, if you look at where, it's not a very clear picture, but yeah, Myanmar is in the circled area long, with a long tail. China, for China to access the West is substantially easier for them to go through Myanmar and into Europe. And equally for India to go to Southeast Asia, you also have to go through Myanmar. So geographically, we're in a very blessed position, but that also allows us uh, a great um, kind of position to do manufacturing and to export it out. So I think these infrastructure growth will prompt FDI, will prompt economic development, and I think these are very simple things that you will look out for. Uh, we're actually, actually quite lucky that you have the Japanese who are closing their eyes and really just want to put money in. You have the Chinese effectively pledging as much money as you want. You also have international agencies, ADB, IFC, World Bank, all of these guys are trying to put money in. And it is actually Myanmar who wanted to be very careful in not over-indebting uh, ourselves. Uh, once they switch that switch on, you will see a lot more development. So I'm trying to paint the picture that actually doesn't take very much for economy to really accelerate in the country. And I think that will happen in the next 24 months. I also want to pick, uh, paint a picture that many of our friend, friendly countries are trying to help us. And really, Myanmar is well poised for a multi-decade type of growth. For many of the lazy investors, as you were talking about, you can almost just stop here and think that Myanmar will become a very advanced economy 10, 20, 30 years from now. And as long as any company that operates in Myanmar does things in a steady, responsible way, they don't take risk, uh, crazy risks, then I think those companies will do very well. So if you want to leave now, that's also fine. But let me talk about Yoma Strategic and tell you a bit more about why we think Yoma is a great proxy for looking at uh, Myanmar. A bit of history on the company. So Yoma, as I mentioned, was listed in Singapore 10 years ago. But actually, the history of the company went back 35 years. Uh, started as a property developer in Hong Kong. We expanded to Thailand. We expanded to China. And 25 years ago, we came back to Myanmar, where my father, the founder of the company, was, uh, was originally born and raised. Since then, we have developed many, many businesses. And in some ways, we have been lucky to have a front row seat in all the companies, all the Fortune 500 companies who tried to come into Myanmar. Most of them will stop at our door. And at least hear how it was like to do business in Myanmar. And many of them have asked us to become their partners. As a result, we've become a bit of a partner of choice to many of these companies. And we engaged in an expansion uh, that happened over the last five, six years. But the company strategy is not built on just a unlimited expansion. Actually, over the last two years, we've worked very hard to be very clear about our overall long-term vision and strategy. So I think our strategy is really built on a few things. One is about strategic partnership. 
we view it as a very important thing, uh, given the speed of development in Myanmar, for us to have the right partners in our uh, core businesses to make sure that we don't make major mistakes. It's much better for us to try to get the best partner to work with us so that we become for sure the number one, rather than do trial and error and a few years later realize that we need some help or we may or may not be able to develop. So we want to be a leading uh, player, the number one player in all the businesses that we do. Because of that, we also recognize that we cannot be in all the businesses. So we're building what we call strong verticals that we can collaborate. We actually will only have three core operating businesses. We're in the middle of streamlining the non-core assets, which includes tourism, etc. All of which may be very exciting, but for a company of your size, which is around a billion uh, market cap, uh, we felt that we need opportunities that individually has to be quite sizable. So you will see us. Sorry, let me just go on. You will see us building three core businesses in real estate, in automotive, and consumer uh, segment. Each of these, we believe, will contribute significantly and are all very high growth uh, segments. We also have an investment division which looks at opportunistic uh, uh, situations. So for example, we invested in telecom towers. When the telecom license were granted, we were unfortunately not able to win a telecom license, but we built the first telecom tower company. Uh, we took a minority stake with our partner, we invested $20 million, and that stake is now worth more than three times more than that. Uh, so within a two-year uh, period, we're able to get a very high return, and that's the opportunity that we get by being in the right place at the right time. We are also investing in tourism, and we are starting to look at uh, power. So these are the core verticals that we will be in, and my view, my vision, and every day I worry about making sure that all three of these core operations are going strong. We're building core competencies so that in a year or two, when a lot more competition may come in, uh, we will be the number one player in each of these. But entering all of those, let me just talk about corporate governance. Because for yourself or for any investor looking at Myanmar, the first question is always uh, kind of how does it work? You know, it's not very transparent, you don't really know how you do business for a business that's been there for such a long time, how can you avoid some of the nastiness that um, people have had to endure in the country? So we have, as a group, made corporate governance kind of our single most important point as we verbalize to the government and we verbalize to our staff. Corporate governance, anti-corruption, is actually the single most talked about item in any of these discussions. We're very proud that we actually have been recognized for it. We, we, we were ranked the top 5%, ranked number 21 out of all the Singapore listed companies in, um, in the most recent Transparency and Governance Index. We were voted the best managed board um, last year. And we had, you know, we've always had very high ranking in terms of the most transparent company. And this is out of all the Singapore companies. Of course, we also are ranked the top uh, most transparent company in, in Myanmar. But to benchmark ourselves against Singapore companies and still come up quite high, uh, we're very, very proud. And the reason for that is we recognize that there is no middle ground in this kind of transparency, anti-corruption, um, uh, respons kind of responsible investment um, spectrum. In a place like Myanmar, the moment that you try to compromise and you know, try to turn a blind eye on things, you will be asked to do more and more. So when we started the business, we were very clear that we would not pay bribe, and we took a lot of, um, as a result, we, we, we took away a lot of the investment opportunities. But I think today, with the new environment, with the much more international uh, way of doing business, we now have uh, the status in the country as the, com the company that is extremely uh, well run and not corrupt, and as a result, the you know, governments are very keen to work with us. Uh, we have IFC, which is part of the World Bank. We also have AED as two of our biggest financiers. Uh, and this is a great position that uh, we'll continue to enjoy over the next many years as we build the business. 
I always say that this is a long-term investment. Of course, I recognize not all of you will view it as a multi-decade investment. So we will look at annually how we do. But I want to quickly highlight in the last year, we achieved a record revenue. This is in spite of a year of the kind of new administration and as a result, a lot of uncertainty in the economy. We achieved record revenue. We achieved 40% gross profit, which is an improvement year on year, something that we measure very closely to ensure we continue to be more and more efficient and more profitable. We had a very high profit, uh, again, uh, to uh, demonstrating that we're profitable, and we have a healthy gearing ratio. But in the long term, if you look at the last four years, since 20, uh, 2013, we've, able to, we've been able to grow revenue uh, two times, so doubling, and we've grown profit 2.5 times. I can't guarantee that these are the type of return that we'll see in the next few years. Of course, we can't make those projections. But the company is really lucky to be in a very fast-growing economy. And for us to do a reasonable job, you should be expecting us to grow at a pace in the long run faster than the GDP growth. So I would hope that we will continue to replicate high, kind of high uh, increase in all our financial matrices, and as a result, grow shareholder value. One thing that we we'll talked about though is that Yoma used to be quite a property-based uh, company. In fact, the description that you heard earlier was about our property businesses in property development, property construction, etc. In the last two, three years, we've made a very conscious effort to diversify. And I'm pleased to say that we're now only 40% of our revenue comes from real estate, 60% comes from our non-real estate businesses. All of them are very high, fast growing. So for example, our automotive and heavy equipment business will be growing at 30 to 40% year on year over the, on the top line over the last two, three years. If you look at our uh, consumer businesses, uh, our KFC, we've opened a lot of stores, actually much more than um, many people expected. And we continue to expect a high growth in terms of number of store opening uh, in the country. So I think that we're becoming really uh, proving that we are diversified from government in a number of key areas and not just focus on real estate. I'll quickly touch on the three businesses since I think we're probably running out of time. Uh, in our real estate, we have a we have three key projects. One is called um, one is a high end uh, real estate development called Punline Golf Estate, Punline Estate. The other one is a medium um, medium uh, positioned uh, market uh, called Star City, which is a kind of mass project. And then the third one uh, is called Yoma Central, which is in city center. All of them is really about building township, and at the end of the day, it's about building communities. So we took a piece of land that is effectively just a paddy field, and over the last 10 to 15 years, we we'll built those into really great uh, living environment. And by doing that, we took land that was basically at very low price into land that is now commanding a substantially higher value. Everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is about adding value to those land, and as a result, as we sell those land over the next 10 to 15 years, we will sell at high and high profitability. So while most people think real estate is a very cyclical business and you have to keep replenishing land and you have to sell more, for us, actually, we have land bank for the next 10 to 15 years. And we, all we need to do is to make sure that that land value continues to increase by doing all these things that we're doing, building the community. Quickly on the pictures, this is Punai Estate. You can see that it's an estate group uh, built around a golf course that's designed by Gary Player. Houses priced at around two million at the top end. Most of the houses are at around 700,000 US. And then some other million that are at lower prices. These are some of the things that have happened, including the Myanmar Open that happened earlier this year. Um, great gym, food varieties, all of these are already existing and we continue to add to them. We have a great hospital and a great school. That makes us uh, really the, the most desirable living environment for any young family. The other project is Star City. Uh, it started a bit later than online, quite a bit later than online, and uh, we're still building it. 
Uh, actually, for both, we're still building, but this one is a bit earlier stage. But that picture demonstrates what it looks like. Much more dense, much more like a condominium um, a city. And again, we're building communities in Star City. One other thing that we have emphasized is we want to be building uh, a recurring income and investment income. So we have an office building, we have some service apartments, all of them are building our recurring income base. And we're also having um, uh, a great school that is there in both um, campuses, in both uh, estates, to make sure that we have the best school to attract the families. This is Yoma Central. This is probably the most desirable address in Yangon right now. It's a 10 acre piece of land. In this, there will be a very high end hotel that is jointly owned by us and Peninsula Group. And then there will be a mixed use complex. So I won't go into this in too much detail, but this shows the quality of the product that we're building. The other business that we're doing is automotive and heavy equipment. I will quickly just go through that. The biggest business we have is really uh, our tractor sales. So I'll take you through some of the showroom. This is our um, construction equipment business. Again, we're the, the exclusive country distributor for these brands. This is where the distributor for Volkswagen. Again, the importer for the country, Mitsubishi. Pino, which is under the Toyota Group and we're the leasing business. The way we think about this business is that Myanmar is at a very early stage of economic growth. So for all these brands, we are the exclusive country distributor. We're building each of these brands so that five, 10, 15 years later, when Myanmar is closer to what Thailand is today, when we're probably selling thousands, if not tens of thousands of units, we'll be importing and making profit from every single one of those units. So we're not just about selling a few hundred or a few thousand cars today. It's about building a business for the next 10, 20 years. Today, our focus is on the tractor. Now, tractor may not be a very sexy business, but what we are doing is really turning the ox carts into machines. And that is very much what the country is actually doing. And that's why the government is very positive on our, our, our developments. This is a little bit about the fact that we're at a very early stage. And if you look at our tractor sales, we expect them to grow multiple times. We expect our construction equipment, when you do all these roads and railways, to also grow multiple times. Car sales, I really don't expect much today. But again, 10 years later, when there's a lot more disposable income, that normally is not bigger than any um, tractor sales or construction equipment. And then you have the leasing business that can be a very large um, contributor. So this whole business, even though the margin is lower, is expected to earn substantial or and grow substantially over the next three to five years. So quickly on to the consumer business. Uh, I think there's no doubt that the consumer businesses in, in uh, developing markets are very interesting. We, uh, I mentioned mobile penetration is now 90%. We now have a very active social media base. And consumer spending is actually growing. And we expect quite high spending by 2030. We're doing a number of things to capture this. And we're really building what I call the Yoga Food Platform. The anchor of this is KFC. KFC in Myanmar is extremely well received. It's an aspirational brand. The restaurants are very packed. And we went from zero stores um, two years ago to today, we now have 13. We, and we are committed to building 10 this year. So if we're able to keep the stores to be just as busy as um, on the new store as the old stores, then the number of stores give you a good indication of how fast that business is growing. The other businesses, we have a distribution of um, beverages. Um, we own a brand that is a local uh, whiskey company, but we also distribute a lot of our other drinks. We have a joint venture with the Metro Group, which is the largest retailer in uh, Germany, and uh, a global business. A lot of that will be driven by e-commerce. We also own the logistics. We have a, co a network of trucks, as well as warehouses. This consumer platform will continue to grow, and we expect ourselves to be a prominent food and beverage um, grew uh, in the future.
So lastly, some of the investments. I mentioned our telecom towers, but we do see a lot of opportunities. And trying not to distract ourselves, we do every now and then look, uh, you know, make investments in very uh, exciting areas. You will see us spinning off the tourism business in the coming you know, near term. Uh, tourism has been an extremely good business for us. We own a hot air balloon operation called Balloons of Bogan. If you look at any uh, uh, kind of tour uh, guide, uh, tour books, uh, you will see the hot air balloon, which is really the most iconic thing in, in the country. Our telecom tower business has grown by more than three times. But let me just quickly show you the power business that we are starting. It's a trial that we're doing with Norfund, which is the sovereign wealth fund of Norway. Uh, we're also partnering with a few others. But Myanmar has very limited power. There's not enough power plant. There's also not a national grid. So even when you have enough power, the grid does not get to the right families. We have a business here where we're building what we call mini plants, uh, micro plants and building a mini grid around it. The way we are doing this is that we will build a small solar plant so you don't have to have a lot of maintenance that provide power for the telecom towers and the telecom operators will pay for that. That in itself will pay for the construction of the plant over the years. And then that gives us a base to provide, to sell power to the villagers. Uh, and over the over time, we hope to cover many, you know, hundreds or if not thousands of villages. And this allows us to be a prominent um, power provider without uh, relying on government contracts, etc. As I said, we're just starting. Our first plant will be operational soon. Uh, but this is a very interesting area because it opens the door for uh, a consumer-based infrastructure company. And as you have daily contact with these villages, you start talking to them about consumer products, and you know, maybe internet, everything that is, um, that is, that is needed on a day-to-day -day basis can be sold. But anyway, so this is one of our new businesses. You will continue to see us being innovative and trying to capture the growth in the country. But I will just reiterate that uh, Yoma is really uh, trying to capture the opportunity in the long run in Myanmar. And I think um, if you have the opportunity to go, I hope that you can go soon because the, the cityscape, you know, if you look at the buildings, if you look at the roads, if you look at even the villages, uh, it changes on a month-to-month -month basis. The economic development there is really quite uh, rapid and it will be a great shame if you don't see it now before it changes into just another big urban city. So with that, I think that's, uh, that's all I would say. I think I've probably gone way over time. But I can take any questions if, if there are any. I'll be around, so if there's any questions, we can, uh, I'm happy to take them afterwards. Thank you, Melvin.